My name is Anatoly Yunitsky. I'm an engineer. I appeal to the leaders and peoples of independent nations. My goal is to warn against the danger hanging over all of us and to show the technological path to a civilizational way out of the critical situation on the planet. The motive of my appeal is the impossibility of further silence and submissive humility in relation to the destructive change that are taking place in the world today, in a situation when not only almost all the basic values of our earthly human civilization, but also our very future than the real threat. All modern humankind is actually challenged where by means of narrow linguistic reprogramming we are offered a transition from existing civilization and vector, technological and intellectual progress, to the destructive vector, personal, social and civilizational degradation. This transition is being waged with the help of digital information tools and media, which now put money before the truth. This plan is being carried out in the interest of so-called underlying power, those who secretly rule our world through powerful trillion-dollar financial levers. Preparation for this plan, triggered by the 2020 epidemiological situation, took more than one decade and even more than one century, starting with Thomas Malthus with his Malthusian trap. We ordinary people can still be protected by our nation-states. They have all it takes to do this. I will explain in sufficient detail about the innovations with the help of which it is possible. First, continuing the development of our technocratic civilization along a creative path. Second, solving the resource, environmental and social problems on the planet. Third, raising the standard of living of the whole humankind. And fourth, giving all of us a chance for a better future, safer, more comfortable and more humane. Our pan-human civilization has once again come to a deadlock. In all previous similar cases, this resulted in conflicts, economic and social crises, empires collapsed, the world map was redrawn. After wars on the ruins, nation-states were even so slowly restoring social and political life while accumulating problems and contradictions in a fashion that each new shock was more dreadful than the previous one. Time and again, humanity has fallen into the same trap. Now we have come across the complex epidemiological situation. No matter how hard they try to serve it up to us as a sort of natural mega-calamity, one can patently see this is not quite so. First, it is clear that current situation is the aftermath of the devastating impact of the human-created industry on nature, as well as immense and nonsensical consumption. Examples abound. The virus is believed to have spread to humans from animals. The blame is assigned to pangolins, according to one version. These animals are in high demand with the Chinese foodies, nourished and even satiated people. Because of this, they came to the brink of extinction. It has long been not about hunger. Pangolin meat is a luxury item, an element of upmarket consumption. Likewise, because of humans, thousands more, if not millions of other species of animals, plants and protozoa are on the brink of complete extinction. About three species of living creatures disappear from Earth every hour. The planet is merely defending itself from offensive people. Second, it is our way of life, which along with the yoke imposed on nature, makes humanity the main culprit in the emergence of viral diseases. First, we began to settle in large numbers in cities, where a great many people are in close contact with each other, 
At the same time, cities are served by obsolete, one might say, ancient transport systems, in which urban, intercity, and international transportation involves large gathering of people in public places, means of transport, train stations, and airports. Second, it is faulty nutrition and unhealthy lifestyle, physical, spiritual, and moral which weakens and destroys our immunity. But immunity is our main medicine, which cannot be replaced with any of the medicines invented by humans. It is easy to note that these same two main reasons are the source of all the most massive shocks of the recent centuries. All the conflicts and economic problems of the 20th century occurred because of overcrowding and a persistent desire to consume as much as possible, resulting in the escalation of the struggle for resources and spheres of influence. This struggle is one of the basic elements of a capitalist system based on profit and around profit. In general, the capitalist system implies the need for an imminence of crisis, which each time lead to more and more serious consequences. Most economic experts agree on this. To this date, knowledge about this has become widespread, right down to the level of the layman. Accordingly, there is a demand for the reform of capitalism, since alternative models, such as, for example, socialism, are not accepted. After all, these are the capitalist elites. They cannot disown themselves. Since crises are mainly associated by experts with overproduction of goods, they can only be avoided by changing the nature of production and consumption. Before talking about how exactly they intend to arrange the new world, we shall investigate how all this is happening now, only in the most general terms. Enterprises manufacture goods, pay workers for their labor, and keep the added value, in order to then spend it on the development of production, their own needs and the needs of the state in the form of taxes. That said, the goal of any production is to increase profits, which is achieved, on the one hand, by optimizing technological processes and reducing the cost of labor, on the other, by increasing the quantity of manufactured goods. Therefore, the volume of production should increase all the time, and the relative wages for labor should decrease. At the same time, it is high workers who buy most of the products. If they earn less, they buy less, and more and more goods and services are being produced. At some point, there are so many of them, so nobody needs them, and the manufacturers cannot sell what they have produced in order to pay off the investments. Then they opt for staff redundancy, assembly line shutoff and production minimization. The economy thinks into crisis, then someone goes bankrupt, someone optimizes something, prices drop for the accumulated surplus of goods, chock full warehouses were really empty, and then there is a demand again that exceeds supply, everything is repeated on another round. A conflict or a disease, by the way, can significantly mitigate the situation, as in a short time they create new market outlets, job opportunities, a request for certain product ranges, orders, and the like. Therefore, all the difficulties begin the moment the economy reaches its peak. This is not an effect of an excess of power, but a way to avoid the upcoming steep and painful fall from the top. But is it possible to avoid crisis in some other way? It is supposed to be so. It is assumed that it is possible to improve the capitalist system, to make its development stable instead of cyclical, from crisis to crisis. To do so, it only requires to organize production and consumption so that they are always balanced and ordered. But of course, not in the planned economy logic, but by providing the ability for the capitalist to preserve their power and wealth. Digitalization should come to the rescue, being a digital transformation of society and economy.
Most notably, it's about the Internet technologies, big data processing technologies, virtual and augmented reality, 3D printing, printed electronics, blockchain, quantum computing, and the like. Digitalization will help to get total control and accounting what and how much is produced, what and how much is bought. It will also form the basis of a new, inclusive, that is a universal capitalism, where an ordinary person will no longer own anything, no private property, but will only use services. And because a life will turn out to be unthinkable over time without these digital services, the demand for them will become constant, increasing in proportion to consumption, without any fundamental restrictions. And there will be none, since everything will take place in a virtual digital environment, and not in a world of material objects that have limits and boundaries. Digitalization is one of the five pillars on which a new world order is planned to be built. Along with it, one one can also speak of the four Ds – the population, the socialization, the industrialization, the carbonization. With the large-scale post-capitalist deployment, these vectors of development proposed by modern capitalism are likely to ensure the stable development of the system. However, this brave new world will turn out to be simply horrific from the point of view of circa 7 billion people for whom there is no place in there. Let's go through the list. Digitalization is the basis. Within the logic in which it is developing today, this is an absolutely unacceptable tool. It includes Firstly, introduction of widespread accounting and control systems at the place of production, in the service sector, in the banking sector, and so on, which will lead in the end to the introduction of total control over the wrong people and the transfer of a number of civilizational functions to the supposedly smart, but in fact primitive artificial intelligence from an engineering point of view which is several orders of magnitude below the complexity of the structure of the simplest microorganism. Secondly, accelerated introduction of bioengineering technologies, the mass production of robots, the promotion of projects on genetic mutations and crossbreeding of species, as well as the interbreeding of people, artificial intelligence and machines, which will lead to a gradual transformation of the human personality into a soulless human-like creature. Desocialization It is the establishment of a new policy, where minorities dominate over the majority. It is opposition to critical and analytical thinking of people. Total censorship complete control and manipulation of the media, social networks, as well as consciousness, ideology, education, science, culture, art, and religion. After all, capitalism needs ordinary consumers, not creative individuals. It is also a natural birth control, elevation of bodily and spiritual ugliness to an ideal of harmony and beauty. It is the expansion of the influence of transnational corporations that are not interested in human health, since only ill people can bring profit. It is the destruction of the institutions of the family and nation-states, which must be replaced by global supranational corporations that have entered the totalitarian phase of their development. It is a clearly defined incremental introduction into social consciousness over many decades of the guilt complex, that is a complex of personal and collective inferiority, with normal people, who are the overwhelming majority, are forced on all continents to repent, to feel guilt, inferiority and faultiness at the slightest pretext. For the fact that we are not homosexuals, for the fact that we have light, not dark skin, or vice versa. For the fact that we have this or that nationality. For eating meat and opposing genetically modified and artificial foods. For adopting the benefits of vaccination and in general whether there is a pandemic. For having a family, a mom and a dad. For using the words man and woman, he and she. 
for being healthy and not disabled, for not believing blindly in global warming and the carbon greenhouse effect, this list of our guilt goes into infinity. Society is gradually and fairly consistently transforming, or rather, it is being transformed into a kind of turbulent, albeit aptly managed, set of minorities dissatisfied with life, who originally from the early childhood are upset with the alien majority. The majority of society, even to the detriment of its own interests, must constantly take care of these people wronged by life, and the interests of minorities, including their frenetic desire to die, dominate over the majority, should not be questioned and criticized, otherwise it immediately falls into the category of racism, homophobia or xenophobia. This reminds me of the story of a cancer cell that deceived the weakened immune system of a healthy organism with billions of normal cells and ultimately kills its master and dies itself by metastasizing into all organs. Moreover, there will be a gradual decrease in the role of nation-states in the life of society, with the transfer in the foreseeable future of most of their functions to global corporations. The displacement of small companies and industrial enterprises from the market will lead to the emergence of global monopolies, which will be free to dictate any favorable conditions to the consumer. The erosion of the functions of the state and their transfer to global corporations will lead to a revision of social policy and social hierarchy. For example, why pay pensions and, in general, do corporations need disabled all people and children, hospitals and roads, and the entire social infrastructure altogether? Therefore, in accordance with the new standards, consumption, childbirth and other manifestations of human life will have to be rationed. This is the only way to support the sustainable development development of the proposed brave new world. Reducing the importance and role of the nation-state is necessary for the beneficiaries of capitalism in order to pay less taxes and, at the same time, to increase the demand for goods and services provided to the population in many countries at the expense of these same taxes. This is about the removal of the intermediary that reduces the efficiency of the capitalist system and adds unnecessary variables to it. Desocialization, along with the fact that, by detaching from society, it makes each individual unprotected in the face of global corporations, deprives him of the hope of receiving help and support from loved ones, who could pass on to him certain necessary knowledge, experience, goods or services. Naturally, he will have to single-handedly purchase everything he needs. Therefore, as the consumer, he becomes much more reliable and efficient from the standpoint of making a profit of him. That is why, under various glib excuses, there is an accelerated elimination of competitors of global corporations, small and medium-sized businesses, as well as personal and private property, with the transition to a supposedly more advanced sharing economy. Deindustrialization is redeployment of almost all sectors of the world economy into a vague and opaque sphere of environmentally safe production running in parallel with a monetization of the environment itself and its transformation into capital for a narrow circle of globalists. There is a widespread change from traditional nature conservation activities to environmental collapse. Accelerated reduction of industries and workplaces especially intellectual and high-tech. Curtailment of the traditional natural production of agricultural products and transition to artificial and genetically modified foodstuffs, in particular, to lab-grown meat that is dangerous to human health and is inferior in its contents and quality, as if a cow is allegedly more environmentally dangerous than a car and an airplane, since it emits a lot of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide and methane, so humankind will have to give up on beef. Decarbonization is a refuel of hydrocarbon fuels, oil, coal, natural gas and CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, replacing them with supposedly green power technologies, ineffective and environmentally no less dangerous. 
decarbonization and deindustrialization are interrelated elements of the same program. In a broader view, they refer to the monetization of ecology, its transformation into capital. People and businesses are therefore forced to pay for the things we need most, such as water and air, whose value becomes part of the surplus value. The demand for this product will be more stable, which will reduce the risk of overproduction. On the other hand, the slowdown in industrial development is the high road to a decrease in the real incomes of the population and, as a consequence, to a decrease in its total number, which is one of the goals of the elites defined as the population. The sustainable development thesis of the Club of Rome assumes an accelerated reduction in the world's population to the golden billion. Hence, the 2020 epidemiological situation that destroy families, immune system of people, and medium and small businesses, the basis of the economy of any country. In fact, it was a seasonal disease, such as influenza, known to humankind since the 12th century, vilified and elevated to the rank of a pandemic in the 21st century by unscrupulous media, under the management and control of globalist oligarchs. Matrix RNA vaccination yet to be properly studied in terms of its long-term consequences which is also carried out supposedly by the most humane self-imposed compulsory methods, also logically feeds into depopulation. Over time, this can lead to irreversible genetic changes in the vaccinated organism, including and negatively affecting the male and female reproductive organs. In its social essence, such treatment can be used, if necessary, as velvet genocide, that is prolonged murder. Also, we probably won't know when such necessity will occur. For example, vaccination is supposed to lead to collective immunity. Also in the documents of the World Health Organization, this is called herd immunity. Humanity is just a herd in which it is necessary to replace the natural immunity, uncontrolled by third parties, polished over billions of years of evolution of life on the planet, with externally controlled artificial immunity, which will be another step towards turning people into cyborgs. Depopulation is necessary for the simple reason that due to the automation of production and similar innovations, capitalism does not need a large number of people for its functioning. Moreover, an excess of human biomass is dangerous for the system, since those individuals who are not involved in production will nevertheless need goods and, moreover, demand them. Therefore, it is better to optimize the population size. On top of all, at its own expense, in such a way that it provides sufficient volumes of demand and is involved in the production of what it itself consumes, that is, the population should be able to feed itself and, at the same time, guarantee an increase in profits and luxury to the world elites, but nothing more. Such a system, offered to us as an image of an inclusive future, will be strictly ordered and self-sufficient. The main difference between such a brave new world and the existing world order is stability, as opposed to cyclicity. That is why globalists repeat the phrase sustainable development. They use every effort to pretend that their actions are motivated by global environmental problems and concern for people. In fact, the reasons are different, but the ecology is just a good product, perhaps the best planetary business resource available to us. Prince Philip, the late husband of Queen Elizabeth II, one of the ideologists of the decrease in the planet's population in 1988 said, in the event that I am reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus to contribute something to solving overpopulation. How do you have to hate humanity to say such a thing? It is not surprising, therefore, that one of the main goals of the Great Reset is precisely downsizing the human population. On October 18, 2019, the John Hopkins University Health Center, in conjunction with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, conducted an exercise called Event 201, 
representatives of business, government and medical organizations discussed the actions that will be necessary in the event of a difficult epidemiological situation. Materials about this are in the public domain. You can easily find a script, videos from the scene, final recommendations and much more. Also, the exercises were held several months before the real epidemic started. The description of the situation on most of the points coincides with what soon happened in reality. The claim that the exercise was a rehearsal for an epidemiological crisis was later refuted by a respected validator the British organization Full Fact. It is not worthy that among the founders of Full Fact are such companies as Facebook, Google and the Open Society Institute of George Soros. It is also interesting that the same platform deserves the credit for refuting a whole series of scandalous news stories directly or indirectly related to the pandemic, the population and the world elite's role in them. These facts include a widely circulated online quote from 2009 by former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Once the herd accepts mandatory forcible vaccination, it's game over. They will accept anything – forcible blood or organ donation – for the greater good. We can genetically modify children and sterilize them – for the greater good. Control ship mines and you – control the herd, vaccine makers stand to make billions. And many of you in this room today are investors. It's a big win-win. We thin out the herd, and the herd pays us for providing extermination services. Now, what's for lunch, huh? They also include his secret report, Memorandum 200, which says that population growth in least developed countries pose a greater threat to U.S. security, in connection with which it was proposed to send forces to ensure birth control and reduce human population. Since 1975, this document has formed the basis of the official policy of the United States. In the early 1990s, the report was declassified. The medical company Big Pharma has been pursuing its goal for 20 years, creating sustainable demand for its product within the framework of the New World Medical Order, in which a person is just a certain subject for conducting experiments, something like a guinea pig. A vaccine is more suitable for this. The demand for it does not depend on market conditions. To do this, you just need to scare all of humanity, all 7 billion 900 million people. Get vaccinated, or you will die, and the demand is secured for many years, for which a pandemic and a constantly mutating virus were needed to combat which more and more vaccines will be needed. The new disease fits perfectly into this scenario, and it is obvious that there was an order for it. Prices for the vaccines that have become indispensable can be raised over time, providing long-term profits for the owners of WHO, which have become not a defender of the health of the world population, but an effective tool for extracting profit from each of us within the framework of yet another anti-human program by a digital convergence, which is being developed and successfully implemented by the world elites within the framework of the 5D program of gradual transformation formation of people into convergent cyborgs. The problems of exceeding the limits of growth and overpopulation of the planet presented since the 70s of the 20th century as the main ones for humankind, I screen behind which they hide other real problems, namely the problems of capitalist production growth limits and the limits of its human capacity. Capitalism is a system in which the few thrive at the expense of the many. The center is enriched by using the resources of the periphery. The basis of the future post-capitalist system is that it will not be for everyone either. This brave future is intended, which is carefully hidden, only for the brilliant million, next to which the golden billion of digitized population will subsist while serving. This is on the one hand. 
On the other hand, the automation of production leads to the fact that the capitalism requirements for labor come down to rather low figures. Those involved in production are useful. They get paid for their work. They are also consumers. But the remaining several billion are something like person dependent that need to somehow, more or less, be elemented and who, on top of all, pose a real threat to the system. If there is anything, they can rebel at any time. The more population there is that has to be fed by the capitalist system, the more unstable it becomes. This is what the Marxists called the main contradiction of capitalism, the contradiction between the social nature of the production process and the private capitalist form of appropriation of the deliverables. That is, everyone exists within the system. But only a few can live well. And the more there are those who cannot, the more likely it is that this poor majority will overthrow and destroy the rich minority. That is why when they talk about overpopulation, they are not at all concerned about the depletion of the planet's resources. In fact, they know that there are technologies today that may solve this multi-component problem. This is how they take care of the preservation of their wealth and dominant position. This is the real meaning of sustainable development for them. They play with concept to achieve their real goals. When it comes to the limits of growth for capitalism, they talk about the limits of growth in general and find ways how, by such manners, to achieve necessary goals and also make money on this. This is their black magic. This is the plan of the world's elites. Therefore, a new reality is systematically being formed with a new serf, a human-like creature without properties, who is easy to control and manipulate on a purely animal level, namely a sexual and soulless, without a historical memory and without identity, without conscience and without morality, without a family and without children, without the meaning of life and without goal-setting except for the sense of consumption and not so much real as virtual and emotional. One should not see in what I've said any sort of plots and conspiracy theories. There is no conspiracy. World elites by masking our faces, the faces of billions of people around the world, unmasked theirs. They do not hide their intentions. They talk about it openly. Anyone can see for themselves. One has only to set a goal and spend a little time. For example, you can read the book COVID-19. The Great Reset, written by Klaus Schwab, one of the globalist ideologists and permanent head of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Below are just a few quotes from it. The world will no longer be the same. Capitalism will take on a different form. We will have completely new types of property in addition to private and public. The largest multinational companies will take on more social responsibility. They will take an active part in public life. Governments must also adapt to the fact that power is shifting from state to non-state actors and to loose networks. Increasingly, governments will be seen as public service centers. The greater population grows, if the higher the risk of new epidemics. If both democracy and globalization expand, there is no place for the nation-state. The containment of the coronavirus pandemic will necessitate a global surveillance network. In this book you can find confirmation of everything that has been said above. And for example, the UK Prime Minister, Charles, Prince of Wales, the President of the United States and many others do not hesitate to declare their consent with Schwab's token points. Obviously, the heads of multinational corporations will also not object to such a program, which clearly expresses their interests. If you are not persuaded by my arguments, read other sources. Watch videos on the internet, there are a huge number of them, nobody is hidden anything, and you do not need to have access to secret archives to believe in what I'm saying. Just take a little effort, so much is dependent on this, but it's important to understand that, along with black magic, 
there is also white magic serving the good cause and not aimed at a new enslavement of humanity. And if the globalist appalls nation-states on the side of darkness, then the nation-states and ordinary people who support them must support the globalist on the side of light. It is quite possible to transform the capitalist system without violating the existing disposition of forces and without shocks. To do so, one won't have to abandon the achievements of civilization and the technological, i.e. industrial, vector of development that our ancestor chose. This can also be done with the help of engineering technologies. But not digital, not nature-like, but natural biospheric technologies. The only difference is that the rest of the future humanity, about 10 billion human individuals, will also benefit being in the heavenly garden spread all over the planet. It is even more important that this will help not only to preserve our common home, the Earth's biosphere, but also to improve its health. Such technologies exist. All of them have been known for a long time. It only takes your political will to start implementing them. If capitalism so much needs the constant expansion of sales markets, this can be done without destroying nation-states and unleashing conflicts, when everything needs to be built anew on the ruins, causing an increase in demand for the products they create. It is possible to grow both in quality and quantity, creating new markets through the development of new technologies and respective sectors of the economy. This can be compared, for example, with what happened in the United States during the year railways and highways were built. In just 10 years, from 1880 to 1890, the Americans built 170,000 kilometers of railways, which is associated with the first economic miracle of the New World. In the 20th century, cars entered mass production and more than 6 million kilometers of highways were constructed, which created a powerful industry, built a single-family home America and created millions of new jobs which ultimately contributed to a significant increase in gross domestic product. Railways and highways are new technology. But that was then. Why is this impossible now? The answer is very simple. Exactly such roads and just such cars and in such quantity are no longer needed. They have oversaturated the market. Roughly the same thing is happening in other areas, which is the root of the reasons for the planned civilizational downshifting, in which there appears to be only one possible way out. Hence we need new engineering technologies, the ones that will improve our real material world, instead of providing an exodus from it into virtual digital slavery, absolutely alien to humans as material biological beings. Digital products, again the backdrop of physical wants, look more attractive for the manufacturer, as they have much more headroom for growth. For example, I do not need a new car every six months, as it will not be significantly better than the previous one. But I may want to change my gadget every six months and buy new software every month since these products can significantly surpass their predecessors. All that is left for the corporations is just aptly prompting me what to wish for in the endless world of virtual opportunities. Flying to Alpha Centauri, growing wings, or traveling to the era of dinosaurs. Digital corporations can time and again awaken desires and emotions in individuals and sell them corresponding means toward these ends. So, in fact, it's not about the desires coming true, but only about their virtual compensation. Moreover, the escape into the virtual world will lead to degradation of the real material world, built by civilization 
at the person himself as a real-life biological subject. But given the plans outlined above, this does not frighten anyone. On the contrary, we are urged forward. First, you don't go to the office, walking remotely. Then you stop meeting other people, family, and don't feel the need to travel. In the end, you just die without producing offsprings. Resetting the system through its digitalization is a blind alley, since we humans are still biological creatures made of flesh and blood. And besides, it's not about a real reset. Since the 70s, from the report of the Club of Rome, what the world elites have proposed is not a reset of civilization, but an arrest to its development, rigid rationing in general, and backsliding into the digital middle ages. Also, a reset is possible, but not through the escape into the virtual world, but through a return to nature, through natural technologies. Such a reset can be carried out in two stages, which will run parallel to each other. First, the use of innovative biosphere technologies in residential, transport and industrial infrastructure, in power industry and agriculture, using all the capacities and capabilities of the capitalist production system. This will secure significant economic growth and will enable massive introduction of these biosphere technologies on a planetary scale. Second, the transition to a new post-capitalist system in which the subjects of economic activity and cultural life are small communities, numbering several thousand people, united at their place of residence in pedestrian cluster villages, within the framework of a single global transport and infrastructure system of linear cities. I will further describe in detail the proposed biosphere technologies and the new system of socio-economic coordinates that may arise on their basis. It is very important that the proposed model is applicable both on a scale of each individual country and the world as a whole. The implementation of the proposed solutions has a great investment potential and can become an impetus for the development of any state's economy. In the future, this will significantly improve the standard of living of all people on the planet, without limitation on the size of human population and without damage to the environment. Digital technologies are not self-sufficient. The basis of any economic system is agriculture and power industry, which are vital. What do modern experts offer in these industries? Genetically modified foods and artificial meat that are hazardous to human health and the transition to renewable energy sources. The first point is quite clear. Eating such products is simply harmful and even dangerous to health. The second is also obvious. The transition to renewable energy sources without large-scale space exploration and the removal of the environmentally harmful part of the Earth's industry therein is only possible if the world energy consumption becomes significantly reduced, which is proposed as part of deindustrialization and decarbonization, followed by depopulation, including through desocialization. That is, here we see a complete conformity of particular points of the 5D program with the general vision that we have already analyzed in considerable detail. Is there an alternative? Yes, there is. This is biosphere agriculture and ecologically clean relief solar bioenergy. Agriculture must be localized in places where people live, within walking distance, making it highly productive on living fertile humus, completely natural and organic, without the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides and genetic modification. Food will be produced here, in the residential cluster, and all its waste, including sewage drains, will be converted here into humus. New food will grow on this humus here in the cluster, which is in keeping with the natural circulation of living matter in the biosphere. Currently, food grows in one place, and waste is generated in another, thousands of kilometers away. At the same time, the annual removal of nutrients from living fertile soil on the planet, billions of tons annually, is not replenished, as mainly only three chemical elements – nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus – are brought back into the soil. Also, plants, during their growth, take from the soil pretty much the entire periodic table. Moreover, simple and soluble chemical fertilizers produced by industry are brought into the soil of farmland instead of complex organic insoluble humates 
created by life, as it was during hundreds of millions of years of the evolution of life and the Earth's biosphere. The energy stored in brown coals and oil shells is relieved solar energy received from our luminary by a living organism that lived on the planet more than 100 million years ago. Therefore, oil shells and coals, which have the same sets of macro, micro and ultra-micro elements as ancient organisms, where the environment was not polluted with industrial waste, can be used not so much to generate electrical and thermal energy as to obtain relict living humus, the basis of the fertility of any soil. This will also be discussed in more detail below. It is proposed to burn fossil fuels not completely, but for example, only by half. Then the combustion waste, ash, slag, sludge, dust, smoke fumes should be mixed with unburned 50% of shale or brown coal, with the addition of any raw materials of organic origin, grass, peat, sawdust, manure, household garbage and so on. The resulting multi-component mixture, in which both organic and mineral raw materials are present, may be finally processed into living fertile humus in bioreactors with the help of specially selected communities of aerobic and anaerobic microorganisms. The resulting living relic humus can be added to the soil starting from 2%, with such a content even desert sand will become fertile. That is, a highly fertile soil will be created around power plants, on which, for example, gardens can be planted. Thus, grapes, apples and other agricultural products will become a site waste from the operation of relic solar bioelectric power plants. This is easy to implement, since in prehistoric times more than 80 chemical elements that makes up all terrestrial living organisms, including ancient plants, turned into coals and shales, and all of them will again give new life to new organisms through the restored relict soil only after 100 million years. Power plants can be combined into unified complexes with agricultural facilities. Then the excess carbon dioxide from the operation of relict solar bioelectric power plants will be fed into greenhouses in cold regions of the world or orchard houses in tropical regions. Their productivity will only increase significantly from this. There, this carbon will be utilized by plants into dietary carbohydrates, proteins, vegetable fats, enzymes, vitamins and other diverse living matter in the form of thousands of various organic compounds that include actually the entire periodic table, the bulk of which, about 60%, is carbon by weight. The heat, which is about 35% of the fuel combustion energy, will be used to heat greenhouses in cold climates or to air-condition orchard houses in hot countries. The nighttime excess electricity will be used for additional lighting of greenhouses and orchard houses, which will also increase their efficiency. The reserves of brown coal and shale will last for about 5,000 years to provide the world's population of 10 billion people with energy at the rate of 5 kilowatts per person, which will amount to a total energy capacity of about 50 billion kilowatts. For comparison, the capacity of all the world's power plants operating today is just over 2 billion kilowatts. A residential and industrial infrastructure should be located in linear cities that will effectively develop not only the already reclaimed lands, but also remote and hard-to-reach territories, thereby solving the problems caused by the widespread urbanization, for example, such as the shelf of the sea or mountains, taiga or jungle, desert or tundra. Gradually, more and more people will want to settle in such places, preferring them for a happy and decent life, instead of wasting it in pursuit of profit in the concrete asphalt jungle of megacities. In fact, the same thing will happen as it was earlier, when people began to move in mass to cities from villages. Only this migration will occur on the opposite direction. 
the attractiveness of linear cities for investors and consumers will be ensured by more comfortable living conditions in them, as well as transport accessibility with significant savings on the construction and operation of the entire residential, industrial and transport infrastructure. For example, if there is a need to get to an existing metropolis, it can be done for an acceptable time and money, even if the residential cluster is hundreds of kilometers away from it. Communication between existing cities and clusters of linear cities will be provided by high-speed transport systems in an overpass design, known as Unitsky String Transport, abbreviated SUST, in which passengers and cargo will move at speeds up to 150 km per hour in the city and up to 600 km per hour on intercity routes. In the future, when creating transport systems with tunnels, where the atmosphere will be drawn to vacuum to avoid air resistance, electric rail cars on steel wheels will accelerate rate up to 1,500 km per hour. Then from edge to edge of the world's largest country, Russia, it will be possible to travel in less than 8 hours with maximum comfort without the tedious waiting at airports and train stations. The implementation of these four integrated solutions, friendly to the biosphere, will ensure the rise of the world economy. Live and highly fertile humus produced at solar relict by electric power plants is one of the most demanded goods in the world today. After all, the fertile soil on the planet is everywhere degraded due to its improper use. The arrangement of mass production of biohumans from brown coal and shale will allow exporting this highly profitable product around the world, making profits even higher than those that oil suppliers have today. Moreover, the need for biospheric humus will be much higher than the current need for anti-biospheric petroleum. The transfer of agriculture to the use of live humus enriched with associations of beneficial soil microorganisms instead of dead chemical fertilizers will increase the crop yield and quality of agricultural products. They will all become organic. In turn, this will be an investment in the health of the world's population and in human potential. It is very important that such products will be obtained within walking distance and by the same producers who will then eat these food products. It is difficult to imagine a better quality control of agricultural products, the basis of our health. In addition, it will also ensure the food safety of all residents of the linear city. The creation of a new transport and infrastructure industry based on UST technologies will provide orders for enterprises engaged in construction and mechanical engineering, production of construction materials, metallurgy, software development, electronics, power engineering and so on. The construction of linear cities will become an incentive for the real estate market, will allow developing remote territories, at the same time a significant part of the costs for all of the above. Power engineering, agriculture, transport, housing can be undertaken by the final consumers, the future residents of linear cities. Since all these elements are part of the infrastructure of cities, just like, for example, an elevator in a house, a playground in the yard, or a parking lot of parts of a residential complex, the cost of which is included in the cost of an apartment bought by a person. The state can stimulate demand by launching various programs, including mortgage services. Then, as linear cities are built and people move into them, the entire socio-economic system will begin to change. To understand what will happen, we need to look at the way of life in the new linear settlements. A residential cluster with an area of about 100 hectares, about one kilometer in size and plan, is designed as an urban-type pedestrian settlement. It will comfortably accommodate from 2,000 people at the rate of 500 square meters of land per person or 25 areas for an average family of 5 people, up to 10,000 people, 200 square meters per person or 10 areas per family. The cluster is designed for construction on land, but with minor changes. It can also be built on the sea shelf or if building and structures are floating in the open sea. The size of the clusters is conditioned by the need to connect the centers with each other with a second urban UST by one span, without intermediate supports. 
It is known that in urban transport stops more often than after one kilometer significantly reduce the average speed of rolling stock, which would lead to an increase in travel time along the linear city. And on spans longer than one and a half kilometers, the string rail track structure will excessively sag under its own weight and the weight of the rolling stock, which will require the positioning of passenger stations at altitudes of 50 meters or more. Therefore, the size of the cluster in in terms of the length of spans within one and a half kilometers are optimal both from the point of view of pedestrian and urban transport logistics and in terms of technical and economic indicators. The residential area is divided into quarters separated with a forest park strip, where common areas for cluster residents and guests are located. Leisure and sports areas, various public buildings and structures, sports grounds, a stadium, a health center, a medical aid station, shops, cafes, workshops, a kindergarten, a school. In the center of the cluster there is a dominant building with a used station on one of the floor or on the roof within walking distance from any point of the cluster for no more than 10 minutes. A string rail track structure runs along the center of the forest park strip at a height of more than 10 meters, visually light and delicate, not even creating a shadow, which with the same performance capacity will be at least seven times less costly than a traditional underground metro. The rolling stock of the high-speed Sky Metro silently moves along the elevated rails, electric rail cars on steel wheels called the Unimobile, which are much more energy efficient than a traditional electric car with pneumatic tires that is greener than it by at least three times. Residential buildings are combined into a single architectural and functional system, a multi-apartment horizontal skyscraper that is a high-rise building lying on its side. The size of the skyscraper, including its length, can vary in a fairly wide range, from 100 meters to 1 kilometer. Each house has a living area of at least 100 square meters and the total area of at least 300 square meters, designed to accommodate an average family of five people. The houses have three floors – ground floor, residential and attic. The houses are made frame type with vacuum glass panels. The thermal insulation properties of such panels with a thickness of up to 20 mm are equivalent, for example, to a brick wall with a thickness of a meter and a half. If necessary, such panels can become screens on which any images can be displayed. There are enough basic materials for construction, sand, on the planet for trillions of such skyscrapers. Each horizontal skyscraper of the cluster is designed for energy efficiency as a house plus energy, according to the European classification. When a house with the help of engineering equipment installed on it, solar panels, collectors, heat pumps, waste heat exchanger generates more energy than it consumes itself. Each cluster is designed as a self-sufficient urban-type settlement, also according to the arrangement of accommodation. It is belong to rural settlements. It is provided with everything necessary of its own production – food, water, energy, transport, as well as all the services needed for a modern village. This will ensure the food, energy and infrastructure security of the linear city even under conditions of adverse epidemiological situation and lockdowns or other natural and man-made disasters. It is impossible to imagine a real egg house without producing a variety of organic food for the needs of each household. Vegetables, fruits, meat, milk, eggs, mushrooms, fish and so on. The roofs of the houses, attics of the horizontal skyscraper in each cluster of the linear city are made in the form of glass greenhouses, in hot countries, orchard houses, combined with each other and have a road in the center for the entire length of the horizontal skyscraper for the passage of specialized maintenance equipment. The ground floor is installed on a common foundation for the entire length of the skyscraper and also has a road in the center for the passage of maintenance equipment. This will allow to grow not only vegetables and fruits in greenhouses or orangeries on the roof, but also in the basement, fish and seafood, both marine and fresh water, as well as mushrooms, poultry and other products for consumption. At the same time, the maintenance of a closed agricultural zone can be common for each skyscraper, a gardener and an agronomist hired by each household. 
microgreens and green food for feeding the residents of the linear city cluster for people and animals will be produced in greenhouses and orangeries, including those made in the form of vertical farms. A solution with nutrients is fed into the root system of plants, and green shoots grow from the grain of plants within five days. This technology is natural, unlike the traditional nature-like hydroponics based on chemical minerals, since plants are evolutionarily created to feed on organic humus. Humus, insoluble salts of humic acids stored in the soil, is converted into a soluble substance by a community of thousands of species of aerobic and anaerobic soil microorganisms directly in the root system of plants. Therefore, humus saponics will be used in the agricultural farms of the linear city when plants feed on liquid humus in which insoluble salts of humic acids have already been converted into a dissolved form. Such experiments have been successfully carried out in the Republic of Belarus by the Unitsky Agricultural Enterprise. Microgreens on humus saponics is a natural organic food rich in easily digestible nutrients and vitamins. It's cultivated technology does not include chemical fertilizers, chemical means of protection, pesticides, herbicides and other toxic chemicals and GMOs. For example, in comparison with dry animal fodder, compound animal feedstuff, meadow hay, humus-based fodder from wheat seedlings is better absorbed, is more energy intensive and contains three times more proteins and fats and in terms of carbohydrates, sugar and vitamins exceeds dry fodder by a dozen times. It is also much healthier and more effective than fresh grass and silage, unlike other feed that is eaten not on a pasture. This fodder comes alive at the peak of its growth, preserving all the vitamins and digestive enzymes that are so necessary for animals, especially in winter. This fodder is fundamentally different from other feeds, since the animal eats not only the above-ground pot, but also the remains of seeds with starch, the root pot, rich in sugars and proteins. At the same time, various organic waste generated in the cluster can be used as a substrate, straw, cake, and even specially prepared wood chips, which microorganisms and plant roots transform, ferment into food that is easily digested. As a result, a balanced, complete feed stable in its composition and quality is obtained, ensuring the supply of the entire variety of necessary nutrients to herbivorous animals. Regardless of time of year and natural and climatic conditions, droughts, torrential rains, heat, frost, humusoponic plants will be able to provide not only animals, but also people with fresh green food all year round, which is especially important for vitamin deficiency in winter. Growing one ton of green feed requires about two tons of water, while the traditional field method requires 400 tons, that is by 200 times more. For traditional forage harvesting for cattle, it is necessary to have about one hectare of land per head, and in the proposed technology, with the use of year-round vertical hemisponic farms, a range, for example, in the ground floors of buildings and structures of a linear city, only about one square meter of floor is needed, that is by ten thousand times less. At the same time, mechanical tillage and fertilization, as well as operations such as sowing, reaping, harvesting, transportation, drying and so on, will be excluded on natural territories by 10,000 times larger. For example, the year-round production of agricultural products in greenhouses under protected ground conditions today in the Netherlands gives an average yield of up to 50 kilograms per square meter per year. Then to provide a family of five people with fruits, vegetables, berries and herbs, it is enough to have about 100 square meters of greenhouse area. If we place such greenhouses on the roofs of horizontal skyscrapers, that is, replace traditional roofs with year-round greenhouses in hot countries' orchard houses, each such house will be able to feed a family living in it with plant food. In addition, the house will not destroy the natural soil, since it will be transferred from under the foundation of the house, even if it is desert sand, to the roof, enriched with humus and will become greener, that is more productive. Mushrooms, fish, seafood, small animals, for example rabbits, and poultry, for example quails, will also be grown in the ground floor of a horizontal skyscraper. 
that is in each house. Thus, the residents of Linear City Cluster will be fully provided with everything necessary for life. Neither the state nor corporations will have to take care of them, which means there is no need for an overall control. At the same time, residents of Linear Cities, who have everything necessary to meet their primary needs, will continue to perform various work within the existing socio-economic systems as a whole. Their work will be paid. They will direct the income to the purchase of goods and services. Services. With a stable supply of basic goods, the volume of demand for everything else will become much more predictable. The probability of overproduction and hence unfavorable periods in the economy will be minimized. The social system will be as stable as possible, because even after losing jobs, people will not find themselves without means of livelihood. This means that the probability that they will go to the protest is sharply reduced. It is much safer for the capital system and the peace of all humankind. All the described technologies have already been created and are being successfully tested and certified in our two research centers in Belarus and the United Arab Emirates. For example, six types of innovative buildings have been built and are being successfully operated, such ones that can be erected in clusters of linear cities, including greenhouses on roofs, a subtropical orangery and a garden inside the house. This garden is arranged according to the principle for natural ecosystem. All sewage in the house, including from that from the kitchen and toilet, goes to the root system of plant, where with the help of specially selected natural communities of microflora and microfauna, several thousand species are processed into fertile humus and industrial water in which with liquid humus. This experiment confirms that a person is able to feed not only himself, but also another person with the waste of his vital activity, not poisoning a wildlife, but enriching it with living fertile humus. Transport systems of the second level, Unitsky String Transport, proved to be no less successful. Six types of string rail overpasses and more than 10 models of rolling stock. Unimobiles have already been designed, built and operated. Several types of electric vehicles on steel wheels have already been certified. Infrastructure elements will also checked. Passenger stations, cargo terminals, turnout switches control rooms, energy systems, communication systems, automated control systems, and others. It took me about 50 years to work on improving biosphere technologies. The complex of technologies implemented within the framework of the project has been constantly expanding. Initially, an overpass was worked out. Its first test section was built in 2001 in the Moscow region. At the same time, the possibilities of using technologies in the context of human settlements development were studied. This work was carried out, among other things, under the auspices of the United Nations, within the framework of two grants that I supervised. The first sample of the first generation Unimobile started to run on a string rail overpass in 2016. Around the same time, developments in the field of agro and biotechnologies entered the active phase. A bank of fertile soils and soil microorganisms from more than a hundred regions of the world has already been created. Currently, all the developments are protected by patents in the leading countries of the world. All this work has been carried out without the participation of the state, despite the opposition from unscrupulous competitors, who obviously saw the danger to their businesses in my technologies. They try to expose my name and developments as dubious. However, the facts are stronger. And today everyone is able to make sure that I'm right and that the biosphere-friendly infrastructure technologies I offer are viable. Anyone can come here and see everything with their own eyes. And I'm ready to offer all this to anyone who is able to develop technologies that allow to reboot the world economy for accelerated industrialization with biosphere engineering technologies in a short time. This will attract huge investments, create millions of jobs in every industrially developed country and stimulate the development of domestic supply and demand. The technologies for this are available. They are ready. We only need the will to implement them. Almost any state can do this. 
нужна лишь воля к их воплощению. Это под силу практически любому государству. The program of rebooting the world economy based on the introduction of biosphere technologies into production, residential and transport infrastructure, energy and agriculture is a way out of the social, environmental and resource crisis in which modern humanity finds itself. The development of a network of linear cities will create in the future an alternative to modern megacities. The whole world will look different. Linear cities will be harmoniously integrated into the environment of any natural and climatic zone on the planet. They will not take away fertile land for building development, but also create it in addition. Cities that are provided with everything necessary for their own production, clean energy, organic food, artesian spring drinking water, the cities due to which deserts will disappear from the planet and it will be transformed in the 21st century into a blooming garden in which all future humanity, about 10 billion people, will live and walk safely and comfortably. It is more reasonable to locate linear cities at altitudes slightly higher than the current ocean level. In the distant future, the rising ocean level will not flood these settlements, no matter if it is due to natural cyclical global warming or if this warming is caused by human activities. Each linear city will be made in the form of pedestrian clusters connected to each other with a city electric communicator of the second level, with a speed of up to 150 km per hour. Unitsky stream transport as the safest, energy efficient and environmentally friendly type of passenger and freight services. The unit air transport and communication corridor with a width of about 100 meters will run along the linear city. UST high-speed intercity routes speed up to 600 km per hour, hyperspeed up to 1,500 km per hour, placed in four vacuum tunnels and cargo systems. In order to ensure comfortable movement in which centrifugal accelerations should be below 1 meter per second square, the red air of curves on routes, both vertical and horizontal, at a speed of movement, for example 500 km per hour, should be at least 25 km, and for 1500 km per hour, at least 200 km. Therefore, the linear city itself can be windy, and high speed roads along it should be as straight as possible. With an average settlement density along a linear city equal to 2,000 people per one kilometer of length, for 10 billion people to live, the total length of all cities built along the UNET communication network, combined with a relict solar bioelectric power plants, power lines and communications, will be 5 million kilometers. In this case, the network of linear cities will occupy an area of about 5 million square kilometers on the planet, or 1 27th of the Earth's land, excluding the coldest continent, Antarctica, and 26 27th of the land will be provided for national parks, nature reserves, wildlife preserves, and reservations with sparing land tenure systems. By the way, the area of deserts on the planet, excluding the polar deserts of Antarctica and the Arctic, is four times larger. That is, if we green up the deserts and build linear cities only there, then 40 billion people will be able to live in them, provided with everything they need – housing, food, drinking water, energy, transport, jobs. After all, it will be much easier and less costly for all of us to do this then. Having finally polluted and destroyed our home planet, to fly to a distant, cold and alien Mars to drag out a miserable existence therein space suits without local organic food, fresh drinking water and life-giving air. At the same time, such linear cities will occupy the land conditionally, since gardens will grow on the roofs of their houses, as well as all buildings and structures, in greenhouses and orchard houses. Natural biogeosynosis and biosphere ecosystems will be created there, even on the site of the current deserts and permafrost areas. The total length of the unit network, taking into account the transverse lines and second-level routes entering protected natural areas and deposits of natural resources, will be approximately 10 million kilometers in this case. 
For comparison, the total length of the global network of all types of roads is 68 million kilometers today. These roads have already taken away the best lands from the biosphere, equal in area to five Great Britain's territories. It is this territory that is already rolled up on the asphalt and buried under slippers. Next to residential clusters, along or across the linear city, there are infrastructure clusters of other functionalities – scientific, educational, industrial, sports, shopping and entertainment, recreational and others. To improve logistics and maintenance of production facilities, including relict solar bioelectric power plants with a large volume of cargo transportation of raw materials and humus, infrastructure clusters are located outside the residential zone, in the area of the unit transport and communication corridor. The required volume of transportation through the cargo component of the network time is about 20 billion tons per year of shale and brown coal, and about the same amount of fertile humus. Each cluster has one or several relief solar bioelectric power plants with a total capacity of about 10,000 kilowatts located outside the residential area. They will produce about 50,000 tons of fertile humus annually. This will make it possible, for example, to turn one square kilometer of desert, this is equal to the area of an average residential cluster, into fertile land of the chernosome type annually. Thus, in 50 years of operation, the planetary linear city will be able to ensure an increase in soil fertility to the level of rich chernosome on the entire terrestrial land. These global changes can occur gradually. It may be a small fragment of a linear city near a modern metropolis, or a stream track connecting a new settlement with an old one, or an airport with a neighboring metropolis. Then these fragments of a linear city can be extended by connecting pedestrian clusters with each other until the length of such a city reaches hundreds of kilometers. Then there will be other such cities. Life in them will be safe and attractive, the air is clean, children play in the nature, not fearing to get under the wheels of a car. The house produces everything necessary for the full nutrition of the whole family. A small community of several thousand people will be able to implement successfully different models of self-government. Proximity to the earth in the linear city will allow a person to return to his origins, to the living nature of which he is a part and from which he was torn away, believing in the idol of scientific and technological progress. Clusters of linear cities will become a basic platform for self-organization of communities, for survival under the conditions of a fierce global competition with a decrease in the role and importance of state borders as some kind of socio-economic regulators. Psychologically, a person always strives to find support and mutual understanding among a community of people close to him by spirit and lifestyle. It is not enough for him to feel like just a member of society and a citizen of his country. A modern person, tired of constant pressure from the authorities, politicians, businesses and advertising, vitally needs a kind of outlet, understanding and solidarity, involvement without benefit and profit, self-realization of oneself and spiritual and moral guidelines, common culture and language. Such social needs, socio-cultural ties, common values, religion, traditions, art, ethnic and interethnic contexts are met precisely in small groups with similar interests. Such self-governing communities of various types manifesting themselves in various ways – spiritual, religious, social-economic, ethnic, organizational and managerial, communicative, political, educational, historical and environmental, and others – can be created in clusters of linear cities. At the same time, the development of science, culture and education, small and medium-sized businesses, tourism and services, intellectual and spiritual development, parenting, communication with nature, growing organic food for themselves and their family members, and other areas of intellectual, spiritual and physical human activity will become the main job for many residents of linear cities. Such work will be more interesting and more significant for any society, including for humanity as a whole, than, for example, today's work as a miner, turner, welder, metallurgist or truck driver, and it will be paid much better. 
Therefore, unemployment and poverty will become a thing of the past when the bulk of humanity moves from the concrete asphalt jungles of megacities, cut off from nature and life, to pedestrian linear cities harmoniously integrated into wildlife. An innovative strategy of transition of local cluster societies of techno-consumers to a new qualitative state, to a socio-technogenic society, will prevail here. Such a reconfiguration of the vector of long-term term development of terrestrial human civilization involves the conversion of military-industrial complexes, the development of planetary biosphere infrastructure, transport, industrial, residential, energy, information, etc., the use of social resources of territories, spiritual and intellectual potential of each person, energy and resource-saving technologies. This transformation will be carried out by transition from global export of resources and raw materials to eco-production of goods and services in clusters of linear cities from the same raw materials, relying on their own strength, interregional interaction and the human dimension in ecology. The capacity of the world market in the proposed program of rebooting the world economy over to the biosphere path of development will amount to more than 10,000 trillion US dollars in the 21st century in seven main directions. First, construction of eco-housing in linear cities, including infrastructure for 10 billion people. Second, annual production of billions of ton of organic agricultural products in all clusters of linear cities, without exception. Third, creation of a network of relieved solar bioenergy engineering based on brown coal and shale at the rate of 5 kilowatts of installed energy capacities for each inhabitant of the planet. Fourth, construction of about 10 million kilometers of the unit transport and infrastructure network, including safe, high-speed, affordable, efficient and environmentally friendly routes on the second level, combined with electric and information networks. Fifth, annual production of billions of tons of living highly fertile biohumus from the waste of released solar bioenergy and organic waste generated in linear cities. Six, raising the natural fertility of soils and improving their biogeosynosis on tens of millions of square kilometers on the Earth's land. Seventh, elimination of deserts on all continents and transformation of the native planet, which gave birth and raised our human civilization into a blooming garden planted on a rich black soil. The implementation of such a program will allow the world economy to develop steadily with an annual GDP growth of 10% and a population of 10 billion people over the next 100 years, without any crisis, social, economic, environmental, research, infrastructure, energy, food, demographic, and others. By that time, the entire environmentally hazardous part of the Earth's industry will be reformed and taken out into near space, where it will be able to develop sustainably for the benefit of our earthly civilization in our material universe, infinitely in time, in infinite space, with infinite resources.